So a little while back, I made a video discussing my adventure through the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion at max difficulty, but I limited myself to level 1. Now what a lot of people commented on is the fact that depending on how you like to play through the game, staying at level 1 is actually a semi-viable option. Now is it ideal? Of course not, far from it. However, there are a lot of strengths to it that, say, a level 20, 30, or 40 run wouldn't have access to or wouldn't have. However, one big issue that I didn't see brought up really much is that staying at level 1, your loot isn't all too great. Now, there are still good pieces to be found, don't get me wrong, but firstly, if there's any gear that requires you to be leveled to find, yeah, that's out of the question. And any gear that has scaling revolving around your level? Yeah, that's also going to be pretty shitty. And enchanted gear is also pretty middling. There's a very limited supply of grand soul gems you can get. Sigil stones are pretty much always awful, and Azura Star is entirely gone. In fact, you can't get any of the Daedric pieces other than the Mask of Clavicus Vile, which is... is debatably one of the worst ones. But this obviously comes out of a trade-off that all of your enemies are usually just as... eh. Now the scaling usually can fuck you hard here, but there are a ton of really powerful enemies that don't spawn till later levels. And enemies that scale off of your level are obviously only going to have a times one multiplier most of the time. Sometimes there are enemies that have a level or two on you by default, but even then it's just a times three. Say for example, it's 15 times your level plus two. Put the last part in parentheses for you PIMDOS losers. Anyways, at level one, that's just going to be 45. If you're level 27, for example, you're looking at a very casual... 435. There's a little bit of a discrepancy there. So for this video, I wanted to take that challenge and flip it on its head, but keep the original spirit alive. So I'm going to skip the typical intro and explain exactly how I wanted to go about that. Console commands. Basically, I'm going to yeet myself out of the Imperial City prison and customize my character there, and start my run with the same exact stats as a level 1 character. My attributes remained the exact same, and for my skills, I decided to go for a compromise because obviously I could level all of my skills to 100, or at the very least quite a fair few extremely easily, but I felt like that kind of took a little bit of that spirit away. So what I went ahead and did was basically enhance the class system at the beginning, choosing two major skills I would raise to 50, and five I would raise all the way to 75. And every other skill remaining would be bumped all the way down to 10. I also made sure to lower those quote, major skills fairly regularly so I don't advance its level. But I do also swap them around on occasion. Say for example bumping Mercantile down to 10 in place of bumping Sneak up to 75. I obviously could, but won't abuse this, and I'll disclose every time I swap it around. Which by the end I honestly want to say was about... 4 skills in total? But we started with 75 Mercantile, Sneak, Illusion, Conjuration, and Athletics, and 50 Alchemy and Destruction. I also gave myself the same amount of gold I earned last playthrough because I am not going to bother constantly picking apples again. And as you're going to very quickly see, it's pretty much going to be one grind immediately replaced with another. But we'll get there when we get there. And then, once my skills were set in place, I raised my level to 255. And you may be curious as to why. Oblivion usually has a soft level cap of about 50 at most. However, you can actually abuse the prison system to continue on leveling past that point. And the cool thing about that is leveled enemies will continue to level alongside you. So to take that level plus 2 times 15 example, we're going from 435 in your average playthrough all the way up to... Yeah, you know, an extremely casual 3,855. No biggie. And I'm going to be entirely honest, the only reason I didn't make it like 
999 or whatever is because I looked it up online and I saw some forum post that was like, Oh, the max level is 255, and I said, Alright, bet. And I never bothered to fact check it. Now, is that a bad thing? Realistically, no. The only thing that would change is the run length. But, I mean, I'm literally already like five times the virtual max, so I think I can excuse myself of this masochism for now. Anyways, for race I went High Elf, and for birth sign I went Apprentice. You may be curious as to why, because in a lot of playthroughs this combo would be considered, uh, fucking stupid. But when every enemy in the game usually has extremely high level spells, and those high level spells already do 6 times damage to me by default, yeah, no, I'm not going to fucking block that, I'm going to perish. So I'll take the extra magicka, thanks. There's also two pretty metagamey reasons we'll get into way later, but we'll get into that way later. Now with all that out of the way, I'm going to reiterate what this challenge is. Because although this isn't a can you beat video in name, it sort of is in practice. I wanted to take that last character and throw them in an environment where the main benefit of being a level 1 character is pretty much just entirely gone and is swamped with one of the biggest weaknesses to show you the other side of the coin. Now I will clarify one thing before we truly begin. Bugs will be used. A fair few bugs. None of them game-breaking and none of them will turn me into an invincible deity, mind you, but there will be bugs utilized. And I guess on the same note, DLC 2? Because Frostcrag Spire is a really funny thing that you should pay Todd Howard a few bucks to get, wink wink. And there's actually a few more that'll be utilized later, but... Fuck it, we're starting now. First things first, I bought a few pieces of gear. Nothing too crazy, but enough to help slightly early game. I also got Umbra with the same exact strategy as the first video, so I won't cover that again. But secondly, I need to begin my army recruitment. So, yeah, this playthrough, I'm gonna essentially be roleplaying as a general. Oblivion has a pretty fucky follower system that I'll get into shortly, but obviously, before getting into too much depth, we kind of need a follower. So the first one I decided to get was Airthor. Now, there's a few others I could very, very easily get, but Airthor is important for a few reasons I'll get into. Airthor is found in the Skingrad Recommendation Quest, which doesn't have any prerequisites, as all you need to do is be a part of the Mages Guild and get the quest. Both of which you can easily do in seconds, and both of which are even in the same building. So it's pretty simple to start. However, Erthor isn't all too willing to just join us, as the cave he's in is full of deranged zombies. So, yeah, we gotta go ahead and get him out of there. For that, I'm going to utilize Conjuration. Specifically, Frosty's making his grand return, but there's an issue. These guys one-shot me. Easily. And they're kind of aggroed onto me a lot. And I love Frosty more than anything, but this is an extremely wide open cave, which basically means I'm pretty much always at risk of a zombie whacking me. And if a zombie whacks me, I'm fucking dead. And sadly, due to that cursed scaling, Frosty is no longer a god amongst men. He's still really good, but... Say, for example, in a hypothetical food chain where the Frost Atronach could just kind of bop on everything in a few hits, Frosty is now found pretty decently high, but nowhere near the top, and enemies can now take pretty consistent attacks from him before dying. And also, Apotheosis, my beloved, can hardly even get one zombie to half health before running out of charge, so... Our two best options in the last playthrough are entirely out the window, so it's time for our first cheese. In the Bruma Mages Guild, there's a quest where you have to find a missing member. He actually isn't missing or away. He's in this shot right now. If you don't see him, that's because he has a permanent 100% chameleon effect, which virtually makes him invisible. Now there's ways to dispel that for the quest, but the thing that's more interesting to us is how he gets Chameleon. Because it's not just a standard piece of gear or a self-cast spell. What happens is another member in the guild, 
Volanero, actually casts a spell on him every morning. So what you can actually do is head to the guild before Jaskar is about to have the spell casted on him, stand between him and Volanero, or Volanaro, I don't fucking know, and BAM. If you did it right, you now have 100% chameleon for a day, which makes you pretty much entirely invisible to everything. The only things that can still interact with you are NPCs that are scripted to interact with you. So think guards and various quests. Other than that, nothing. You can cast as many spells, you can swing as much, you can steal as much, and nothing will happen. Absolutely no repercussion. Now, can you get 100% chameleon forever? Yeah, actually extremely easily, but... That's a little bit too good to bust out just now, so... Yeah, we're gonna go back to that cave and fight the zombies with no threats of retaliation. Which is a good thing, because it takes roughly two summons of Frosty to kill every single one. And there's a lot more than one zombie in this cave. But after Frosty commits his grand zombie crusade, we can recruit Airthor, and we now have our first essential follower. So there are many, many types of followers in this game. But the ones that we're going to be utilizing the most are the ones that permanently follow you and fight enemies. If you played a Bethesda game, or really any RPG with companions, you should know how that works. However, the main thing we're looking for at the beginning are certain flags. Obviously, we're going to ignore followers that don't fight, or have a specific quest or location requirement, but namely the two most important ones are essential and respawning. So if a follower has the respawning flag, say for example the ever-adored adoring fan, if they die after enough time, you can recruit them back. And the recruitment options will vary, sometimes they'll just show up again, sometimes you have to go back to a certain location, and sometimes you have to recruit an essentially identical NPC. But for now, the one that we're looking for the most is the Essential Tag. What this does for us is that if an NPC would take lethal damage, they don't die. Instead, they are knocked unconscious and get back up after a short time. This is absolutely huge, as not only does this mean I don't have to worry about healing or taking care of that NPC, but after about three or four recruited up most, they have essentially permanent uptime in combat. Like, sure, they may very well get knocked on their ass and take a few seconds, but like, if there's still a few more people whacking them, there's just gonna be an endless cycle where, yeah, they're gonna come back up, they're gonna have a lot more health, and if those people get knocked on their ass, they're gonna get up before the other person does, and vice versa forever. So, yeah, as you may have guessed, Erthor is one of those essential followers, and now we have a virtually immortal bodyguard. And what's better is that Erthor actually knows Conjuration. So now our warband has potentially four members on board, which is just fantastic. Now you may be curious, how long is Erthor a follower? And the answer is potentially forever. As long as we never go back to the Skingrad Mages Guild, Erthor will follow us and be a potential follower for eternity. So, yep, Warband is underway. Our next stop on this Warband is Coral. There's a quest we can accept there called Separated at Birth. An NPC called Reynold Germain gives this quest and the entire gist of it is that people in Coral thinks that they saw him in Shadenhall, and he was acting rather uncharacteristically. Which is kind of insane when you think about it, because in lore that's like a trillion miles apart, but... I don't know, I'm not here for it. Anyways, you head to Shaden Hall and you find Gilbert Germain, who's actually Reynolds' long-lost brother. Hence the name of the quest. After telling him the situation, he'll begin to travel to Coral to meet Reynold. It's a happy reunion, fun times all around. Afterwards, though, you get the next quest, Legacy Lost. The two want to reclaim the home that they grew up in, Weatherlea. Because one day ogres just showed up and they were forced to leave because fucking ogres showed up. So now you have to find Weatherlea because the brothers don't remember where it is, and asking around you can find the general location and then you have to travel there and clear the ogres. 
Very simple stuff. Afterwards, though, you can report back to them, and the brothers go, Oh, thanks, dude. Uh, can you take us there? Because we kind of don't remember where it is. And you know what? There, you usually just fast travel to the location. The brothers go, Oh, hell yeah, dude, and give you the reward, and blah blah blah. A few days later, you can start the Sins of the Father quest. We don't care. Really, the Jermaine brothers are going on a journey with us, because they're gullible enough to believe that this is the most ideal route to Weather Leia. Look, soon enough our stories and routes are going to get absurdly mixed up and convoluted, so just don't think about it until it's time for me to make a joke about it later on. Our warband is now 4 strong with a potential cap of 6, so our next step is actually going to be something you probably don't expect. The main quest. Yeah, holy shit, crazy, isn't it? So, I'm not actually going to bother summarizing the main quest's lore and story and steps and instead go into how fucking dumb this challenge is about to get because instead of level 1 Dremora Churls and Stunted Scamps with 20 to 44 health, we're now dealing with level 255 Zivoli, which have an extremely casual... 3036. And, uh, keep in mind, I do one-sixth of my damage to them. So every enemy is now a sponge. And not only are they a sponge, but they're scary. We're talking Game Boy Advance SpongeBob SquarePants scary. They have scary destruction spells, they got summons, they got guard and shield spells, they do a ton of damage, they have disc spells, they have spell absorption, they have reflecting damage, they have multiple resists, I don't even know what the fuck they don't have. So with this, this makes every battle take approximately 18 fucking years. And that's if the battle is going ideal, which sometimes it just doesn't. I'm not even going to talk about the Oblivion Gate, I kind of just ran past everything, but Kavach itself was a fucking nightmare because with 800 men just running down every enemy and punching them and slashing them and bonking them and making them fly all over the place, the Zivlai pretty fucking regularly just got into positions where they couldn't be attacked. Which pretty much just meant one of two things. Either I have to attempt to get them out, or load an old save. And sometimes I just couldn't get them out because this Fisher Price ass game just decided to have comic antics like this happen. This dude right here is just totally happy, unbothered, in their lane, flourishing. And it isn't because he's a Daedra either, the guards are just chilling with him too, not fucking killing him and not progressing the quest. So okay, jot this down in your notes. Standing in the fire, totally okay, you can do that. Just if you decide to take a break in there, make sure to tell your supervisor because we don't do paid breaks and sometimes he can be a little bit stuck up and will kind of reprimand you. So just make sure to clock out, okay? However, this random fucking wooden pillar with absolutely no special properties that is in no feasible sense on fire or touching the fire... What were you thinking? <laughs> Did you really think you could do that? Come on, dude. We're, we're trying really hard to save a city here. What the fuck are you... <laughs> People these days just don't want to work. All they do is eat hot chip and lie and expect a paycheck. So, yeah, after like 800 years, I rescued Martin, and guess what? It doesn't fucking matter. I did a bad. Now, firstly, the Mythic Dawn here have a level of aggression towards me that is only comparable to a 17-year-old high schooler with a god complex because they never face any real adversity in their entire life. And secondly, Joffrey is just getting cancelled over here and keeps fucking dying and giving me this melodramatic game over screen. And you know what? I can't really go and give him a healing spell because with my restoration skill, I basically heal him for a fraction of a percent of his health with every single ounce of my magicka. And that's even assuming I can heal him for any amount because the Mythic Dawn aren't fond of me existing and will run me down pretty much no matter what, so... Yeah, you know what? I just reload an old save to where we just saved Martin and don't go to fucking Wayne and Priory. Guess who forgot to save uh, after the entirety of that battle and just has to sit through it all over again. So, 
Yeah, we abduct Martin again, and I cast a worst restoration spell of all time, and... You can tell I'm not having a fun time, because I pronounce time like a fucking Australian just now, even though I literally have never been there in my entire life. So, yeah, crikey, of course the entire time I had to hide, because if the Mythic Dawn catched a whiff of my existence for half a picosecond, they would annihilate me, but eventually... Joffrey decided that death isn't very poggy-woggy, as the Twitch youth would say, and advanced through second grade problem solving and didn't die immediately. Now luckily for whatever reason, the second Joffrey goes, shit dude, you know where we should all go? Cloud Roller Temple. It's pretty cool and my friend's parents own the place and they'll let us crash there rent free. Todd Howard decided it was about time he gets his rightfully earned essential flag, so yeah, that's cool. Thank you for making me waste an hour of my life on this shit, but better late than never. But whatever, it's fine I guess. We got not one, but another two additions to our warband, increasing our total to six to eight. So at this point we're kind of gaming, we can start to snowball our run now. For the next recruitment we have a fair few options, but I decided to start the Fighters Guild questline since we have a bunch of people we can potentially recruit there. But during the first quest where my ragtag group of misguided idiots were all collectively wailing on a fucking goblin with 8,000 HP, no hyperbole by the way, I started to realize that my followers' gear was, uh, not an exceptional quality. And the really fun thing about followers in this game is that you don't really have that cool handy dandy, hey let me check out your inventory so I can give you 800 pounds worth of shit to carry button. The only way for them to equip gear is if it's laying on the ground or nearby, and what they have is broken, which is about as reliable as Comcast's internet service, so instead, we're going to cheese. Now firstly, let me go ahead and say this cheese actually doesn't do a whole lot logistically. In terms of damage, it's actually a very minimal increase, and in terms of survivability, it's just kind of so I don't have to look at naked men the entire game. Which, nothing against that if that's what you want in your Elder Scrolls game, but it's not really for me. So what I wanted to do was give them all swords. Now like I said already, I can't just give them the item like in other Bethesda games, and I can't really drop the sword and just expect them to pick it up either, so what I have to do is reverse pickpocket the swords onto them. Now there's two reasons why this is kind of hard. Firstly, the companions themselves, aren't really a fan of it. So that means there's a whole bunch of potential repercussions that can happen, but as I've described earlier, we already have access to a 100% chameleon effect, so that's not really a big concern. More of an inconvenience than anything. The really big issue is that they won't use armor or weapons if they have a weight. So that makes your options basically null, except a random subset of extremely specific items, and basically no weapons. So, yeah, we're going to go cheese. Bound weapons and bound armor. So basically what you can do is if your bound item gets damaged while the spell is active, you can repair it with a repair hammer. And obviously in most cases this would be entirely worthless, as you're repairing a piece of gear that is... temporary. It's going to run out regardless of its durability, and it's durable enough that you're never going to have to worry about it actually going to a low durability before the cooldown is over. However, onto the actual cheese and the point I'm trying to get at, if you repair the item, it'll put it in your inventory, meaning you can drop it. And if you drop it and then wait until your spell runs out, you can then pick it up and now you have a permanent bound item. In terms of stats, they're obviously really good, but more importantly, they weigh zero. It's annoying, sure, but basically all we're doing is repeatedly using bound claymore, whacking a skeleton, resummoning it before it can attack me and probably kill me, repairing the claymore before dropping it, and waiting to pick it up again. And pretty much just vice versa for bound armor. It's extremely annoying, but goddammit I'd rather this than all of my companions cosplay Supperman and, uh, make me suffer. For all eternity. 
Also, to be wholly transparent, I did this about four times and went, yeah, this is cool, and just did this instead. I literally started this run with console commands, you cannot judge me. Afterwards, I decided before going down another quest line that I was going to get two very easy companions out of the way, both of which are DLC. The Battlehorn Castle one is extremely easy. Firstly, obviously you need to gain access to Battlehorn Castle, which you can do by clearing out an entire one Marauder group, and afterwards you have one of two options. You can immediately pick up a Brotherhood Man-at-Arms, or alternatively, if you want to feel cool, you can go to this inn, talk to this guy, and you can buy a Castellan who follows you around. Now I'm going to go ahead and plead ignorance. I don't really think there's a conceivable difference between the four men-at-arms, the first Castellan, or the one you can buy if the first one dies, but... You know, given the option between Brotherhood Man-at-arms, Brotherhood Castellan, or Castellan Athon, and Castellan Athon is the only one that you can't get back, I'm sorry, but one of these names sparks intimidation, and the other ones just don't. Afterwards, we can head on to Frostcrag Spire, which is admittedly really boring, but still welcome. You get to choose a permanent Atronach. So at first I went with the Storm Atronach, because I'm pretty sure statistically it's the best one, but it is extremely slow. It is not going to catch up if there is any amount of running required to get from place to place. And as much as I love Frosty, he's a little bit too beefy. There's just a little bit too many hallways and tunnels and other various locations that he just can't get through. And with our current roster, not only is him not showing up a bad thing, but there's a very real possibility he just can block people from entering at all. So although I would say that the Fire Atronach is my least favorite one comparatively, for how it slots into our team, it's by far the best one for us statistically. But with both of those on our side, we can head to Anvil for our next follower. It's honestly a really fun questline, and it's easily one of my favorite in all of Oblivion, and I want to say it's a fan favorite in general. Basically, this dude has a haunted house that he's trying to sell off to any poor soul who buys it, but we don't know that. So what we're going to do is buy the key and deed off of him real quick, go inside the house, realize this guy must have been a capital G gamer with this level of cleanliness, and uh-oh, spooky. Also at this point, every combat encounter is starting to sound like this, and it's just fucking insanity. Yeah, so this isn't all too great from, a. Uh, homeowner's perspective, and honestly, if we really want to be evil, this is also awful from a landlord perspective. So we're going to go ahead and find him and go, what the fuck, dude? Problem, he skipped town. The instant we bought the place, he immediately left for the Imperial City. And even after confronting him, he still won't help us, saying that he knew there was a curse on the place and telling us that he won't help us lift it because Toby Maguire over here missed the part where that's his problem. However, if we get this cool skeleton hand diary, we can take it back to him and his demeanor entirely changes and he's like, eh, yeah, that's cool. Let's go ahead and do it real quick, eh? And yeah, let's go ahead and do it real quick. Dramatic irony is when the audience knows something that one or more of the characters of a story does not. Afterwards, we meet up with him back in Anvil and head inside the manor together. We kill a few ghosts by the entrance and he tells me, Alright, let's get to the basement and hopefully I can open up the cool secret room for you without too much fighting. But joke's on him, that's stupid. Honestly, from like a story perspective, this is probably the funniest follower yet, because he's really only an essential follower for 30 seconds-ish? Maybe a minute or two if you're playing on an extremely high difficulty? I don't know, at one point or another, I feel like this warband has to go, Damn, huh, this is a pretty weird route to Skingrad. Oh, what's that? You're heading to Weatherlea? Huh. Oh, you're heading to Cloudroar Temple? Well, why the hell is this dude taking us to Aldi's? 
but honestly this guy is just literally trying to get into the basement to open up one room and leave. You know, go ahead and wind down over at the Imperial City. Find a wife, have some kids, get a job that he really likes. Preferably anything but going to the depths of oblivion with a psychopath that looks like this. And I just won't let him. But afterwards, we now get this really funny message. And I'm going to go ahead and do a game show bit real quick. Guess what happens when the prompt, You have too many followers, appears in the top left corner. Is it A. Any followers that aren't related to quests are sent back to the location where you recruit them. Is it B. A follower in a predetermined order will talk to you and leave, potentially leading to a failed quest. Is it C. The game will no longer allow you to proceed with any quests that have followers associated in it. Or is it D. Literally fucking nothing because Todd Howard was involved with this game's production. Yeah, it's a pretty hard one, but I think you may know what the answer is. But afterwards, I do make a fucky wucky and decide to pick up the Staff of the Everscamp, which summons four infinitely respawning Everscamps that follow you forever. Now, one thing people don't really know about them is although they don't fight, you can actually use a command spell to make them attack targets for as long as they are in combat which is neat because that means you can just cast an extremely basic one second spell and have four scamps wail on an enemy for a theoretically infinite amount of time. That's honestly really good. Do you know what isn't as good and something I didn't really think about? The ever scamp scaling. I kind of got all wrapped up around how cool of a concept it was to have four scamps following me around that I didn't even really think about the difference between a scamp and an ever scamp. And the ever scamp has, uh, 10 HP. Honestly, at extremely low levels, this is actually just fine. Like, if an enemy does 4 to 8 points of damage, that's at least 2 hits per scamp. And if they don't attack very fast, it's actually more than possible to send out a continuous wave of scamps because they respawn really, really fast. However, when your average enemy has 1600 HP and easily one-shots them, the theoretical benefits of having them along now heavily outweigh their realistic disadvantages. The most important of which is that we're currently at 16 followers that, uh, follow me. Almost anywhere. Including buildings. There are some buildings that I can hardly traverse through anymore. So we're going to be replacing them soon enough. I like them, I wish I could keep them along, but it's a little bit too much. But now we're going to proceed through the Fighters Guild a lot more, which has some quality comic antics like this. I sure do love never being able to move. And after a few more quests, we hear about a Bosmer named Maglier. Maglier has a very bad tendency to default on contracts, which is... I mean, if you really take a close look at the Fighters Guild, is kind of fair enough, but I digress. Point is, after enough contracts, you get assigned to do one that Maglier didn't. And a few more after that contract, you and Maglier can do a contract together, and... Yeah, that's kind of all we have to do. He's also essential, and sadly, the last essential follower we're going to get. There's a lot more in the game, and there's actually a bunch more in the Fighters Guild, but... I have no clue if it's possible to actually get more than one follower in the Fighters Guild, even with proper planning. And that's not me being hypothetically skeptical or cynical, I actually just don't know. And there's a bunch more super late into the Knights of the Nine questline, but... We'll get there when we get there. But our warband isn't complete. We have to keep recruiting. Heading to Shaden Hall, you can hear rumors of a corrupt captain. If you then speak to Lavana to figure out more about the situation, she'll then point you to Garrus who will then point you to Aldos. Aldos is a local drunk who turned to alcoholism after the death of his wife. And after a whole bunch of drunken antics around town, he got so many fines that he couldn't afford to pay it anymore and was thus evicted from his house. 
Since then, he's kind of just been on the streets, drunkenly singing about cliff racers, which, although is a beautiful song, is kind of annoying. Then, after talking to him, he proceeds to do this comic antic. This is my house. Get out of the way. Move, I say. Sir, this property has been seized by his lordship, the Count of Chainhall. Leave immediately. <laughs> Look, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to be an apologist here, but this is really just classic Bethesda writing. Stick with me because this is my video and I'm about to derail heavily, but there's an interesting dilemma here with an overzealous guard who are strict to the point of ridicule and possibly even fear. And then you proceed to fuck it up with this drunk being a complete idiot towards this guard who's literally just doing his job and is completely calm and rational. Albeit maybe a bit too immediate. And when the drunk pulls out a fucking dagger to attack the guard who is literally just standing there doing absolutely nothing, everybody is like, damn, I can't believe he'd be driven to the brink like that. What fucking brink? The dude literally just stood there. And I think Bethesda realized this in writing and went, Oh shit. Wait, the guard are kind of strict, but they're not really the assholes we're making them out to be. So they went for the classic Bethesda tactic of only being able to make morally gray scenarios if they have a, you know, pretty... Eh, not really all that appealing to look out of a shade, but ultimately still a shade of light and then just casually dumps in the most abyssal shade of black possible and made Ulrich the most completely aggressive asshole for no reason. I don't know you, and I don't care to know you. I don't know you, and I don't care to know you. Get out of my way before I have you slapped in irons. I was writing games when I was, you know, 12, whatever, and I'd be like, I'm gonna make video games. Anyways, this lady wants to kill this dude with rats. So we go, hey dude, let's meet up with this lady so she can totally not kill you with rats. And overall, he's pretty excited to see if the lady will try and kill him with rats. So yeah, in our fun interconnected web of absolutely awful pathing, we're trying to get to this lady's home through hell. How are any of these people still with me? I may have too many followers, but what's the game going to do about it? Oh yeah, also, this is our first non-responding, non-essential follower. Sophie gets casually yeeted into the stratosphere. That's that. I'll never be able to get him back and the quest is pretty much over. I don't really like that concept, so if he dies, I'll usually just revert back in time and tell him that this really was never the way to the lady's house that totally doesn't want to kill him with rats, and instead, it's this way. Although despite me saying that, he's currently our only follower, and is actually the only follower we'll ever get that I actually can't tell to stay. Once we tell him to follow us, he's going to follow us forever, whether we like it or not. Which is kind of fucky, because if for whatever reason he dies, say for example he decides to try and punch, uh... Mayroon's Dagon and he just gets blown up, the quest will actually proceed and tells me that I killed him. I never fucking killed him, I tried to tell him to stay here, but instead he tried to punch a fucking Daedric god. How is that on me? Yes? Although your intentions were good, your actions were despicable. Murder is the lowest form of revenge, in a road I would never dare to tread. As always, you're a welcome sight. I'm going to be honest, I am unable to provide any commentary here because any attempt at banter, or wit, or jests is actually just significantly outclassed by the game just running. Bethesda makes some of the best comedy games ever made, and that is a fucking cold take I am willing to stand by. Also fucking hell, I'm getting rid of this staff, the Everscamps are getting on my last nerve. I have to concede. 
the quest premise isn't inaccurate. These scams do be annoying. Anyways, it's time for our last member of the warband, Mazoga the Orc. This one is actually extremely easy. Other than the ones I just buy, she's actually the easiest one by far. You go up to Count Marius Caro of Leowen and ask him how you can serve. And he just goes, hey dude, there's a fucking orc who just barged in who claims she's a knight, but won't tell me what the fuck she's on about. Figure out what the fuck she's on about, please. And Mazoga, despite having a splitting headache that rivals only Jotaro's and Stone Ocean, is pretty funny. Like, really, she has some quality banter. I love her. She then tells me that she wants to talk to Weebenna, who's an Argonian hunter. So we gotta go get him for Sir Mazoga. He doesn't particularly like me enough for him to come along, but if I give him a small loan of a trillion dollars, he'll come along. Mazoga asks him about the location of Fisherman's Rock, then demands he takes her to Fisherman's Rock, which, uh, doesn't really work out. But us, being a good tier 3 sub, can take her to Fisherman's Rock now. We are not going to be taking her to Fisherman's Rock now. And with that, the Goon Squad is assembled and on the move. The best and the brightest of Cyrodiil is assembled under one banner, all following me with great pride through the depths of hell to go to very easily accessible locations literally all over the country, and some of which are not even a minute away. So, now it's time we get gear and an actual build going. Haha, <laughs> just kidding, it's pilgrimage time because I decided it was about time I did the Knights of the Nine questline. This quest is objectively a quest of all time. I can't really be upset. It's not hard, there's no combat encounters, there's not really anything really. It's just not enjoyable, I guess. But after activating the last way shrine, I had a little bit of a horror movie moment as God calls me from the heavens and I lose the ability to utilize basic body movement functions and, uh, yeah. Something is definitely going on here. I couldn't tell you what, but it's definitely something. I mean, halfway through I decided it was a better use of time to see the Imperial City textures than actually care or respond to the conversation. It kind of reminds me of that rug. I don't even have to say a name, it might have already popped up in your head, but in case it didn't, that rug. Honestly, who even fucking makes it? I see it everywhere, but I still have no clue what it actually is. Anyways, after this, we have this quest, which is... terrible. I don't like it. I'm not going to give you the specifics on a dungeon run, but every enemy has 10 quintillion health, and with how much water there is, my followers have this really funny tendency to die, which would have been fine a bit ago. But now that we have a bunch of non-essential followers? No, not really, I'm not a fan of it. And I'll be honest, I don't really know what I'm doing, so it was like 30 minutes of me going in random directions hoping my followers don't aggro onto a lich halfway across the continent and drown themselves. And that happened quite a lot, especially because there's a bunch of verticality. Like for example, this extremely simple wall with a hole in it. Followers do not understand what jumping is, so they just kind of run in random directions or into walls trying to get up it. Or alternatively, go, hmm. You know, this lich, the one like three stories above me in an entirely different segment of the same dungeon, I'm pretty sure if I just run into this and swim underwater for enough time, I might be able to get to him. They were not able to get to him. But after that complete disaster, we do this super badass quest where we head to a seemingly abandoned priory, activate a hidden staircase with a ring we got in the last dungeon, and we 1v9 a bunch of crusaders to prove our worth. But I don't really do that. The crusaders are permanently aggroed onto me for some reason, so I have to abuse positioning and make sure I'm aligning myself to have a line of sight with him in between all of my companions, but other than that, there's not really a whole lot to comment on. And now, we done goofed. So there's a pretty interesting quest here where you have to go to the shrine and have a bear just wail on you for a few seconds to prove your worth to Kinnereth. Problem. 
If you attack Kinnereth's bear, you fail the quest. Which is fine, I can do without trying to 1v1 a bear, but the problem is if the bear takes damage at all, I fail the quest. There's a little bit of a problem there. And even if I went through all the effort to tell them all to wait outside, Ulrich Land is so convinced that this is definitely where the lady who doesn't want to kill him with rats lives, and he cannot leave. So, yep, I fucked up. I can't beat the quest. Yeah, I never even wanted to do the Knights of the Nine quest line anyways. Sure, there's two followers I could get there, but really, nine is just a dumb number. What if it was Knights of the Seventeen? Now we're talking. Seventeen is a great number full of great potential. Nine? Eh, pretty boring. Now, uh, one thing about this warband that is actually really annoying is Joffrey. Martin is... fine. I enjoy Martin's company, but Joffrey is an asshole who likes to spam this huge AoE frost spell, and that not only makes people kind of upset with him, but it actually has a very high chance of just outright killing me, so that's not particularly great. And you know what, ever since we recruited him, our warband more than doubled from a theoretical cap of 6 to 13, so we're fine with what we have. We can just let him go. Also, I should probably clarify the possible max we can have. If we decided to do the Dark Brotherhood or Thieves Guild quest, those both have one follower. And as you can probably guess, we're not doing either of those because trying to do them with 13 people breathing down our neck. You How dare you steal from me! It's not really ideal, to say the least. And again, I don't know if you can have more than one follower in the Fighters Guild, but throughout the entire questline, there's potentially four that you can recruit. Obviously, we already have Maglier, and there's also Modron, Lady Rogbutt, and Viranus. But for the sake of this point I'm trying to make, we're just going to go ahead and assume that two are possible. There's the Adoring Fan, but he doesn't really fight much. I could be entirely wrong, I think there's like an incredibly slight chance he'll punch something. You might even be able to use a frenzy spell, I really don't know, but with so many goons at our disposal, he doesn't even really have use as a possible target, but screw it, let's count him in too to make a point. Although on that same note, I'm not going to count the ever scamps because they're dumb and I don't like them. There's a whole bunch you can get throughout the Knights of the Nine questline, but I'm pretty sure the maximum you can have is up to two with Umbacano, and he has a guy called Cloud who follows him around, and... Yeah, Cloud is a follower of a follower. And since he follows the follower who follows me, that's basically two followers. Yeah. And you know what, if you're going exceptionally hardcore, you can actually literally just have yourself as a permanent follower because this is a Fisher-Price game, who can also summon their own goons, and if you have an item, say for example, the Sanguine Rose, you can have up to two more Daedric summons. So that boosts up our theoretical cap from 13 all the way up to 22, if not 24 because I don't know about the Fighters Guild. You can have a literal World of Warcraft raid of followers. And honestly, it's kind of something I miss in current Bethesda games, even if this is 100% not intentional. You can also min-max most of these followers to Oblivion and back, but we'll get into that later. For now, I think 11 is a perfectly fine number. So let's get Joffrey and Martin to Cloud Roar Temple, and then do some more quests to get ourselves a bit more powerful. First things first, I went ahead and got the Mask of Clavicus Vial because I don't really have too much need for Umbra, and it's going to be good to have a Daedric item to throw at Martin as fodder. Secondly, Azura's Star. Having an infinite soul gem is a little bit good, so we're obviously going to do that first. We ran into a little bit of a problem on the quest though, and that's this extremely simple trap. So this is a trap that, you know, wax into you with the forces of gravity. So usually in your standard playthrough you might get whacked by it, you either get hurt or maybe even die and you'll go, oh shit. And if you got hurt you just run backwards and if you died you just go back and make sure to 
run into it before running backwards. You know, extremely simple shit, I don't need to explain this to you. But there's a problem. When 11 people are running into it, the Fisher-Price engine has a little bit of an issue knowing how much damage it'll do because its gravitational pull is fucking everywhere and it just whacks everybody to death. So, yeah, it took a few attempts to get my goons to not commit suicide en masse, but once we do, the actual quest itself is pretty easy. It's just kill five vampires and we outnumber them two to one. So their threat was pretty minimal. And by the time we actually kill the fifth one, there's nothing stopping me from just leaving and having all of my followers teleport outside. Avoiding this complete fucking disaster at the very beginning. But once we obtained Azura Star, I also decided to go ahead and do Sanguine's quest and get Sanguine's Rose. But there's a problem here. For whatever reason, all of my gear is removed whenever I exit the jail, so, uh... I can't really get that back. Also, this is horseshit for whatever reason now I've stolen from the Fighters Guild? Huh? As far as I'm aware, I haven't really stolen shit from any of them. And again, Bethesda's Fisher Price engine is striking back with a vengeance because the second I decide... Yeah, you know what, it's not really all that cool that the game is nitpicking and biased. Utilizing console commands is actually just stealing from the Fighters Guild, what? What type of fucking ass-backwards 14 follower Twitter user logic is this? You know what, whatever, I don't need to do the Fighters Guild anyway. At least we're still a part of the Mages Guild and can get some cool summons and spells. You have been found guilty of breaking guild. He can be found at the arcade. What? What the fuck did I steal? And why is this only a problem now? Look, I'll be transparent with my crimes, uh... I pirated an illegal version of World of Warcraft Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King, and Mists of Pandaria. Uh, I used Nintendo emulators for randomizers. I think I'm on an FBI watch list for googling war crimes, but have I ever stolen from a fucking guild? No, what are you on about? And now even my own companions don't know what the fuck to do. Maglier literally just doesn't have dialogue and Aerithor just stares into the abyss. Bethesda really coded this on their electric hooked on phonics wordmaster, so whatever, I don't care. Except I kind of do care because our second piece of gear we're getting is also a classic Hooked on Phonics comic antic. So there's a really cool set of gear you can get with the Deep Scorn Hollow DLC. With all the housing DLC, if you buy all the upgrades, you can find a piece of equipment that appears in a newfound container. So, for example, if you buy every single upgrade for Frostcrag Spire, I can find the Pentamagic Loop in a jewelry box right here. It's pretty neato, but that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is the Raiment of the Crimson Scar, which at level 25 and over gives us Fortify Agility and Speed 15 points, Sneak, Marksman, and Blade by 25, but by far the best attribute of all and the reason we really want it, 35% Reflect Damage. Which means every time an enemy swings at us with a melee weapon, we'll be taking 35% less damage and deal it back to the enemy. This doesn't affect bows or magic, but obviously just being able to reflect damage is insanely strong, so we want this piece of gear. Problem. You don't just get the level 25 raiment if you're buying everything and attempt to loot it at level 25 or above. That's psychopathic and makes sense. Remember, Oblivion was coded on this thing. Instead, the gear's level is generated when you install the DLC. You know, the DLC you automatically install the second you boot up the game. The one you would never even consider turning off because it's a housing DLC you're only going to invest in way later. The DLC that, due to being installed when you start the game, now permanently has level 1 loot? Yeah. Thanks, Todd Howard. Games. Yeah, use your imagination, I got the 35% reflect damage somehow, and also I tinkered with my stats a little bit more. I bopped my illusion and mercantile skill down and replaced their levels with destruction and restoration. 
But now, it's time for the most fun part of this entire journey. We need to get leveled gear. And I dungeon grinded for over an hour, and the best piece of gear I got was a ring that let me water walk. Which is cool, I like it, I'm going to keep it, but it's ultimately not going to help me if an enemy decides to summon lightning from their palms to instantly evaporate me. So we're going to do something different. Firstly, we need the skeleton key, which is extremely easy, I'm not going to go in depth. And now we have access to the quickest way to get our mandatory pieces. Do you want to see what the quickest way possible looks like? Yeah, I played Oblivion Cookie Clicker for many, many minutes. So the two pieces we're looking for are the Ring of Iron Fist, and either Amulet of Axes or Necklace of Swords. All of these pieces reflect damage by 33%, which when combined gives us a 100% reflect damage effect. Well, actually it's 101%, but we're not really looking for the damage, we're more so just looking for the immunity. So, yeah, with all of this, this gives us total immunity to melee weapons, which is fantastic for us. And, by the way, do you remember when I said this took me many minutes? I lied. It didn't take me anywhere close to minutes, it took me many hours. First, it took me over an hour and a half to find my first Ring of Iron Fist, which means I no longer had to find it. And of course, this game being developed by fucking Fisher Price gave me seven more Rings of Iron Fist before finding a singular Amulet of Axes or Necklace of Swords. And I got fucking legendary at this grind. I can do this forever. Its muscle memory is forever implanted in me, and I could do it with my eyes closed even now. So, at the very least, I was watching Northern Lion and Loco TV the entire time, but since I have to generate the loot every time I want to go in, that means I also have to go ahead and pick the lock every single time. Which, with my currently limited security skill, means this. Now I want you to go ahead and imagine this sound for hours. Upon hours. Upon hours all the while requiring your full attention because gear is funny in this game. I did not enjoy myself, but goddammit, eventually I got my pieces and I can move on to the next step. First things first, I actually never mentioned the main quest, despite actually doing a few quests up to this point. Look, you've either played Oblivion and went, oh cool, it's the main quest, or you haven't played Oblivion, in which case it's not exceptional enough to bring up. But... In the Path of Dawn, in the quest where you're trying to find all of the books of the Mythic Dawn commentaries, there's a segment where you go down with Boris into the sewers to meet up with the Mythic Dawn. One of the Mythic Dawn members in that meeting is Raven Cameron, the son of Mancar Cameron, who is a very not good man. Raven Cameron, past level 22, has a 100% chance to drop the mundane ring which not only has a resist magic effect of 50%, but also a reflect spell percent of 35%. Now you may be curious as to why I want this, as obviously I chose the Apprentice sign and am a High Elf, meaning the magic damage I take is basically infinity, and that's because reflect spell doesn't exactly work in the way melee does. So to run with a 35% for an example, this doesn't mean that the attack is reduced by 35%, or gives me a flat 35% reduction. Reflect Spell instead has a percent chance to reflect the spell entirely. So with this one item, I now have a 35% chance to reflect the entirety of a spell if it hits me. So that's why I actually don't care much for my weakness to magic, because obviously if I'm reflecting the damage in its entirety, it doesn't matter if I'm reflecting 2,000 or 20 damage, I'm not taking any damage. And with that knowledge, we're now after our next piece, Spellbreaker. Spellbreaker is the reward if we decide to go for Periite's quest, and is the first of a very few instances where companions don't follow us. 
So we're in an entire plane of oblivion, tasked with finding specific people in specific locations, and the entire time virtually invincible Daedra are just targeting us down, so... Yeah, that wasn't great. So I had to run, and run, and run, and run, and run. But after doing the quest, we obtained Spellbreaker, which gives us a pretty scary 30% reflect spell chance. And now there's a bit of a problem. The only pieces of gear I'm not currently using is my helmet and sword. And the only real piece of gear that gives us a neat reflect spell chance is the Alien Crown of Lindai which is obtained near the very end of the Knights of the Nine DLC, and there is currently a bear and an ACAB guard in the way of that, so I can't do it. And even if I did do it, that only gets me up to 90%. So there's still a 10% chance I die from spells. But I did actually also get an Amulet of Reflection, which gets me up to 85. And with that, that gives me a few ways to then reach 100%, but obviously since I would then only have 70% reflect damage, I can now die from that. So although we're really far, if I want to become well and truly immortal, I need to go through a bunch of the Shivering Isles DLC and during the main quest of rebuilding the Gatekeeper, I then need to select the Heart of Wound sharing part, which allows me to create a Reflect Damage spell effect. Then I could slot that onto certain pieces of gear and then get my Reflect spell up with other pieces, and uh... Here's the really big issue with that. My companions won't follow me into the Shivering Isles. Meaning if I want to do this, I pretty much only have two options. Either suffering, on a cosmic scale because every enemy is going to take several thousand hits for me to kill, or I enchant all of my gear with 100% chameleon and just bum rush it, which is maybe cool for 14 seconds. Well, chameleon is really boring. You can get it on five pieces exceptionally easy, and at that point you just win. You don't need reflect spell or reflect damage if the enemy isn't going to be attacking you. Logistically, is it the best choice? Absolutely. You can get Chameleon on so many different effects that getting this would take maybe 20 minutes at most. But it would be exceptionally boring because the entire game is me casting a snowman going, woo, spooky. N nobody cares. It's not interesting. What the fuck was I even on about? Oh yeah, Reflect Spell. Um, I could also go for alchemy or spells to get one or either of them up, but the problem is those are fucking expensive. One is expensive in resources and the other is expensive in magicka. So, I'm sure there's some weird hyper-precise build I can go for utilizing the half and half items there are, such as the Ring of Namira, but honestly at this point, here's the option I'm going for. I need to abuse my Reflex spell chance. There's a 35% chance it kills me instantly, but those odds aren't the worst. And there's a few ways we can abuse this, but we'll get into them when they're applicable. Which, for a proper segue for once, let's actually skip through the main quest to one of these said applicable parts. Here is Sancrator. My followers do not follow me into Sancrator. This is a problem because the nearby Gloom Wraiths have 6,000 health and the Undead Blades have an excessively casual 7,140. My axe at this stage doesn't even do one damage to them. So, do you know what time it is? 300 time, baby! Yeah, this is fuckery, but it's effective and reliable fuckery. As long as we're holding the door and are actively blocking and moving to ensure that only the skeletal blade will be hitting me through the door, we can actually kill them fairly easily. And this is a really sad sentence to say, but about 2000 HP in the swinging at me, their weapons tend to break and they start dealing a lot more damage to themselves when they start trying to kill me with fisticuffs. Well, it's not really fisticuffs, but you know what I mean. Skeleton. But after over two hours of constant shielding, 
holding, positioning, and shouting Leonidas lines in my mind, we got through it. Was it fun? Well, I mean, the entire time I was just thinking about cool Leonidas edits I could do, but realistically probably can't because YouTube would copyright strike me, so... Nah, not really. This is where we hold them! This is where we fight! This is where they die! Anyways, it's time for the Bruma Gate. I decided to try and bum rush through this real quick to see if... For the first time ever in every combined Oblivion playthrough that has ever happened across the entire multiverse, the Allies for Bruma Quest was required. It wasn't even close. As much as I hate to say it, I guess that one guard from Anvil won't be making it up here today. Also, Martin looks like a dope. He still has his bound helmet and sword from our last misadventures, and honestly, it's cute. Like, I don't know, dude, this dude is about to become the Emperor of Cyrodiil, this super hyper badass, and he's still wearing my shitty, free, entirely illegitimate Burger King crown. It's like when you're a kid and you make a shitty drawing, and your parents actually keep it up on the fridge for so long that you're graduating high school and you come back for a family dinner, and sure enough, the drawing is still there. Is it good? Probably not. Does it look stupid? Hell yeah. But is it cute? Yeah. I think it's adorable. I love it. Anyways, happiness aside though, paradise. Let me tell you what Mankar Cameron's fight was. We had to position ourselves in a location where we couldn't get attacked by melee constantly. Usually up on a chandelier, I think or hiding in the corner like a scared child and bashing anybody who comes to get us away. Then, once we secure our position, we equip our Amulet of Reflection instead of our Amulet of Axes to get up to 85% Spell Reflect chance instead of our usual 65. And just hope and pray that we don't get hit with that 15% chance of instant death. All the while, we continuously summon Frosty, and the actual Chadwick Eldamil whacks Mankar, Raven, and Ruma because although he keeps dying infinitely, he keeps respawning infinitely, which is just beautiful. So after 25 minutes of spell reflection, Frosty abusing the Camerons, and Eldamil committing tactical suicide enough times to make your average gold 3 inting Scion main look like a genius, we did it, Reddit. We beat the Camerons. Anyways, we come back to Cyrodiil. This quest is easy as hell because we have a Legion, and honestly, even if we didn't have a Legion, we can just run past everything like a true hero. And we beat Oblivion at max difficulty and kind of, sort of, max level. So, after beating the game, I decided it was time for all the followers to return back to their rightful destination. Sir Mazoga headed to Fisherman's Rock and avenges her friends. Velwyn opens up the secret room and lets me purge the manor of evil spirits. The Jemaine brothers return to their childhood home of Weather Leia to live out the rest of their days. My Castellan gets to return back to his comfortable and safe post at Battlehorn Castle. My Flame Atronach tried to 1v1 a guard and perished in the middle of nowhere. I have no clue where it is, and at this point, I'm just gonna hope that it's, like, taking a really deep nap or something. Orish the Land gets eaten by rats. Aerithor gets to return back to the safety of the Mage's Guild, and we go ahead and complete the contract me and Magli were sent on. I hope we'll get the skin grad soon. You've stolen from the Fighters Guild! Shit. Well, goodbye to that happy anime ending. I could rejoin the Fighters Guild, but Bethesda was heavily influenced by Blizzard Entertainment's recent hit, World of Warcraft, and decided that if I want to return back to either of the guilds, I'm going to have to very casually supply them with 500 bear asses, and I think my life could be spent much better. So, Mazoga doesn't avenge her friends, Velwyn has no clue why we still left the manor, the Jemaine brothers practically believe Weather Leia is fucking Atlantis now. The Flame Atronach is still dead because I'm not a necromancer. My Castella no longer gets to rest. Ulrich no longer gets eaten by rats because all cops are bastards has been rebranded to all cops aren't breakfast. So, uh, yeah. I guess they're sticking with me until the end of time. So, 
fuck it, while we're here, let's go ahead and min-max our run. Everybody gets enchanted gear. My companions are now all invisible because bound armor is good and chameleon is a balanced effect. They were reluctant to put it on for a bit, but after casting a 4000 magicka disintegrate armor spell I got from Best Buy, they decided that was as good a time as any to equip it. And I also gave them an OP sword and resurrected my flame atronach from the dead. Decided this bear was fucking stupid and got my two companions from Knights of the Nine. Tried to get my Dark Brotherhood guy in here, but he casually just didn't give a fuck. But after all of my preparation, the final battle approaches. The true threat to Cyrodiil has emerged from the Endless Dark. The Mythic Dawn, Mankar Cameron, hell, even Mayrun's Dagon were all merely just expendable pawns to an even more powerful threat. An omnipotent force that threatens all of reality itself. Three hundred mountain lions. May the fires of conflict serve as our penance. Oh, okay. Uh, well, Cyrodiil has been effectively erased from the timeline. 300 mountain lions succeeded in their grand crusade to erase existence itself into the infinite nothingness. Anyways, uh, thank you to my patrons for supporting me. To vocally announce your names for that extra parasocial spice. Thank you, Droopy, Breadman, Catapultman1, Chair, Judge and Jury, Wobkitten, Skarner Crystallin, Teddy Bear Guy, Cray, Minister of Sauces, Mr. Bones, Naho Yuzu, Pyro Musical, No Goat, Blazeheart, Angus JS, and Snailio. Your support means a lot, and I promise I'm using the money to good use. Look at Bug. I am now the first person who has ever lived to transmogrify a mop into a cute little puppy. And if you too, casual viewer who may not be a patron, desire your name to be parasocially read out loud in my enthusiastic voice, as well as delightful MS Paint drawings such as the ones you're seeing on screen now, feel free to check out the link to my Patreon. It's pretty neat, I think. And as always... All of this just works.